Hey everybody, this is Perch, and there's been some confusion, I think, recently, as I've done videos talking about overshipments and incentive programs and everything else. Why don't I feel like that's theft, like that's a, a terrible thing for the retailer? And I, I guess it's all in the words, right? Do I, I don't think this is a good thing. I don't think that the variant programs, the incentive schemes, and all the rest of that stuff, I don't think that's a positive thing. Um, I admit, I am neutral on the uh, overships. And I think the reason being is I've never lost money with overships and, and nobody I know who's uh, being honest with themselves has lost money on overships. And I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but there's been some, some really false numbers thrown around there. Some guy was like, Oh, I, I, uh, God, I don't remember who it was, but it's like, I spent $4,000 on overshipment uh, shipping fees last year. I'm like, you know what? Um, that's impossible. Like if you spent that much, you are receiving the uh, new comics equivalent of Midtown. So I, I, I'm going to say you are exaggerating. But I, I, to be clear, I don't like, I mean, God, I've done enough videos here. I don't like variants. I don't like incentive programs. I don't like the idea of, hey, you have to buy 150% of this in order to get this. I don't like it. Uh, but I don't think it's theft, and I don't think it's coercion, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, I don't feel like I'm being forced. It's been very easy for me to opt out. And, and that's where, again, I get to, if it's easy for you not to participate and it doesn't cause you problems, and the problem that you would get if you didn't participate in the incentive programs is you wouldn't qualify for certain variant covers. And that idea that you have to pay for something in order to qualify for something else is, is pretty standard across all kinds of retail industries, not just comics. Uh, the, the biggest and most obvious one is, you know, companies like Johnson and Johnson and other places that have, uh, you know, Procter and Gamble, these companies that have a lot of different products under their belt. Uh, they will frequently do the, you need to buy this toothpaste in order to qualify for this discount or this cardboard stand up of toilet paper, whatever it happens to be that that happens all the time. It's very normal. Do I think it's uh, bad? Uh, no. Uh, do I like it? No. It's a, it's a, it's a headache. It's a, it's a burden and an annoyance for me as a retailer to have to deal with that kind of nonsense. But I don't think it's theft. It's very easy for me to say, you know what? I don't want the cardboard stand up of the toilet paper, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to order the shampoo over here. It's, it's the same thing. Um, what would be healthier for the industry in its current state is to not do this. I, I think the, the biggest problem with the, the incentive program is it basically creates a false expectation of what is selling and what isn't selling. And why that is a problem is because it is, uh, we're, we're built on a very fragile industry right now. And the logic, if things were healthy, would be, hey, get more copies of The Incredible Hulk on the shelf, and it will look like it's more popular, and overall, all boats will rise. Everything will improve. That's the, that's the thinking. That's the logic behind this plan. And it's, it's, that logic is correct only if things are healthy. If things are not healthy, and what I would define as not healthy is if, you know, your first shipment of a product, and I'm deliberately abstracting the comic stuff out of it, if your first shipment is 100,000 units, and your second shipment is 30,000 units one month later, 30 days later, then that indicates that the first unit was built on a lot of smoke and mirrors. It wasn't healthy. It wasn't sustainable. And it really means that the industry has to analyze and assess the business on the low number, not the high. The low number, in this case, being 30,000, which means that the inflated number is a bubble. It's, it's fictional. That's not healthy for business. It's not healthy for, for comics. It's not healthy for the industry. But arguing this is a little tricky because it, it is a, you know, people will say it's a victimless crime. What's going on? Um, and again, it's not a crime. It's not anything illegal. This isn't something where I feel like Marvel or you know one of the big publishers is twisting the arm of the retailer unfairly. I, I, it's not. But doing these this kind of stuff and creating this level of fluctuation in the numbers and the cornerstone of the business that you're running has detrimental effects over time. It, it, it erodes confidence in the business. It doesn't generate any kind of feeling of stability. And ultimately, it just weakens where people think the business is at. Uh, that's, that's where we sit. You don't, you know, no retailer who's looking at this 
takes a look at their numbers and says, ah, I see that I was ordering, you know, uh, Catwoman at 20,000 copies every month. And then one month I ordered it at 100,000. That must mean there's some growing interest in Catwoman. Nobody views it that way. Nobody bills it that way, markets it, or promotes it that way. And the biggest flaw in this whole plan is that the uh, the publisher, they're not thinking, hey, I'm going to squeeze some more money out of Catwoman because I'm going to sell it to some people who don't want it. That's not what they're thinking. The reason why they do the incentive program this way is that they're thinking, hey, if this shop gets more Catwoman, then people will buy it. Then it will, uh, you know, it will it will basically get more popular, and more people will buy the comic, and everybody wins. The retailer wins, and the publisher wins. That's the logic. That's the thought process. And once again, that logic works if the business is very healthy. Okay, if you're talking about kind of what game companies have done in uh, in big box stores, or I, I, yeah, I mentioned like Johnson and Johnson products. They'll do things where it's like, hey, you will qualify for a deeper discount on the, the mint toothpaste if you order more versions of the charcoal toothpaste. And then more versions of the charcoal toothpaste will get on the shelf. People will be intrigued by it, and it boosts their overall toothpaste business. But, you know, the difference are, one, people need toothpaste. You, you, you know, the, you can't really do without toothpaste. You need it. You don't need comics in the same way. And two, that business is moving millions of units all the time. It's a very healthy, very robust, very strong, constantly changing business. It's not a niche business like comics has become. And that's why the same thinking, the same plan, which makes, again, complete logical sense if everything's going well, breaks down with comics. The numbers are too small to play around with that. The distribution channel is too small to play around with it. And this product is not a commodity that anyone needs. Even though I absolutely love comics, and I do, and I can't imagine a life without them, I, I, can't, I don't need comics to survive. Nobody does. I technically don't need toothpaste to survive either, but you'll be pretty super gross if you don't, uh, you know, who doesn't use toothpaste? Uh, anyway, um, so that's, that's my standing on this. I, I mean, again, people, I've had some people get really um, heated in the comments saying, you know, I don't understand why you don't view this as criminal activity. It's like, well, because it's not criminal activity. It is legal to do this, and it is, um, you know, it, it is something you can avoid. I have managed to avoid the incentive programs by and large, um, in, but, I, but I've also bought in on them. I bought in on them when I know I can turn a profit. To me, this entire discussion can be simplified this way. Can the retailer, does the retailer know enough about his or her business that they can turn a profit in whatever they're ordering? And if the answer is yes, they know if they order the extra copies of this thing over here that they can sell the variant cover for more for that, and so they're they're making more money than they're spending, then it's the retailer's business, and the retailer would be smart to do that. But for the industry in general, outside of the retailer, having extra copies of comics floating around that are unsellable or that nobody actually wants, that's not healthy. That's the part that is 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 not healthy, in my opinion. I said I'd mention overships, and I mean, you know, again, briefly, I, I, I have a different view on overships. So overships, uh, once again, for the industry, I think it's unhealthy to be just shooting comics out there that nobody's going to buy. I don't think that's, you know, hell, from a pure environmental standpoint, I don't think that's healthy. But um, overships are far easier to turn a profit on them. The, the money that you pay in shipping is insignificant. Even if you went to any other location to dump these books off, you know, forget about a dollar bid. You put it in a in a ten cent bid. You are going to make money on these. You're going to make money on these comics. And the idea, again, the idea, the core idea behind overships is a little bit more sound. That idea is, hey, the retailer, uh, they don't realize that they want more copies is because we're doing a big thing in this comic. We're doing a big uh, storyline boost, new creative team, new artists, everything else. So we're looking out the we're looking out for the retailer here. We're gonna give them more copies of something that that's gonna hook a reader. We just we did such a piss poor job of our uh, you know of our promotional text of our solicitations that we just we just know people are gonna want this, so we're gonna give it to them. That makes sense. Now they've abused that by overshipping things that nobody wants, but you know, fine. Um, overships. It, it, it's again, the, the, if anyone ever tells you, hey, the shipping costs are outrageous with overships they're 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 making that up or they're they're 
far exaggerating, or they don't know what they pay in shipping, which is a more horrifying thought. Um, the, the shipping costs are not a factor here. Um, but, you know, again, I think there's a lot healthier ways to market and run your business, way more healthy ways. And that's the real discussion that I wish people were having. It's, it's, this stuff is, uh, it, it's not helpful. Um, I think you could argue it's slightly harmful. Not harmful to the retailer, but slightly harmful overall to the business. Uh, but the biggest, the most harmful part of it is there are better ideas out there that we need people getting to. In my opinion, anyway. What's yours? Leave a comment below. Like and subscribe. Uh, see the description of this video for how to get in touch with me. And thanks for listening.